Hi, I'm Leah Wheatholter, owner of Workman Forensics, and this is the Investigation Game Podcast. Welcome to the Investigation Game Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Gavin Maines. Dr. Maines is a nationally recognized expert in e-discovery and digital forensics. He is the CEO of Avancic, a firm that provides e-discovery, digital forensics, data preservation, and online review services. Dr. Maines founded this Tulsa-based company in 2004 after graduating with his doctorate in computer science and serving as a professor at the University of Tulsa. He there led the creation of the nationally recognized research efforts in digital forensics and telecommunications security. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Maines. Well, thank you for having me. The majority of our listeners are investigators, fraud examiners, forensic accountants, and so I was wanting to focus our discussion today on utilizing digital forensics and e-discovery as part of an investigation. So would you first start off by giving us a high-level definition, description of digital forensics and e-discovery like what are they, how are they similar or different, and where do they intersect? So historically, digital forensics has been around for a relatively long time. When I was a college professor, we helped local law enforcement deal with computer forensics, which is what it was called back in the late 90s. And that was mostly dealing with floppy disks full of porn or fraudulent transactions or check counterfeiting. It was a very easy thing to deal with. We really didn't have in the late 90s a lot of the cyber crime or the hacking that we have today. It was a different internet world. But digital forensics is what it became in the early 2000s. And we actually started our company in 2004 doing just digital forensics. And that was investigating computers, internet browsing activity. If you think back in 2004, we didn't have the iPhone yet. We were still dealing with flip phones and things like that. And so digital forensics was the act of gathering information for the purpose of presenting that data either in court to an investigator or some internal investigator so they can make a decision. So digital forensics is the core of getting computer information, looking at it, and then presenting it to a non-technical person. And the reason I tell you that story of 2004 is 2006 rolls around and the federal rules of civil procedure change and the advent of e-discovery, the word is born, is they had traditional discovery in civil litigation and now they put an E on the front of it because that's what we did back in 2000. And they called it e-discovery because it was different. And so we were told about 2006, hey, are you guys doing e-discovery? And we said, e to what? We're a digital forensics company. And it turns out they're the same thing. Digital forensics and e-discovery are both taking evidence off of devices or computer or electronic evidence and preparing it such that it can be presented to the court. What we saw over the mid 2000s, the late 2000s, was they distanced each other because people were saying, oh, I don't want to do digital forensics because I don't care about evidence that much. And we said, did you hear what you just said? E-discovery and digital forensics are both the preservation, the collection, and the presentation of evidence before a court. So that's the super high level of the two. I view them as the same. There are several people that say, no, no, e-discovery is a subset of the field because it's, quote, easier. And there's some truth there as well. Digital forensics has some differences that I'm sure we'll talk about uh, through the rest of the podcast. Yeah, and I want to take that high-level definition and, like, kind of get down to, you know, as a fraud examiner, I usually get that call. Money has been stolen. Clients digging through records and computers. I mean, they've already ransacked the computers usually by the time they call me and they need help. And so for a forensic accounting standpoint, our practice at Workman is that we obtain data from third parties. And so we don't even touch their records till much later, if ever. Sometimes we don't even need them. But in that scenario, when they call, what should I consider or another forensic accountant consider when we begin working with the client to determine if we need to give a company like yours, Avancic, a call? So unfortunately, it's a judgment. And we generally try to get a legal counsel involved to help us make that judgment because there are proper ways to preserve digital evidence. And preserve is the first stage in the different models that exist out there. The most popular is called the e-discovery reference model, and it works for forensics as well. So preservation 
the definition is the act of stopping things from being modified or deleted or sometimes changed. You know, we don't want someone to open up the ledger, make a change, and then save it after we've noticed there's an incident, because then we have to explain that. So preservation is the act of stopping things from being deleted. And so you, as a investigator, an examiner have to go and say, oh, this doesn't smell good, something's wrong, or my client doesn't have the technical skill, I'm worried about this. And unfortunately, in the civil world, that generally falls to an associate or a paralegal, or in some cases, a, a, a partner at a law firm saying, oh, we need to get this preserved, and we don't think our client knows what they're doing. However, this is only worth $100,000 to just get it done. And so there's always an economic portion for how much energy someone's going to spend. But unfortunately, at the beginning of an investigation, you have no idea. And, and I'll give you the kicker right now. The tools and techniques that we use to preserve and therefore sometimes collect the digital evidence are free. You know, I don't have ridiculously expensive tools for preserving and collecting evidence. You know, it, our most common tool we use is something called FTK Imager by Access Data. As long as you're willing to give them your email address, they'll give you a forensics tool that will let you collect entire QuickBooks files, Word documents, Excel documents, in a manner that doesn't modify them and puts them into a evidence container. And so to answer your question in more directly, it's about how do you feel that your client needs or has the expertise or does the case warrant the expertise to go get it elsewhere? I've seen corporations are getting better and better, even the small ones, at preserving data or moving online. And so some of this is becoming a little bit irrelevant, but we still have to, it relies on the first responder to decide, do we need to get help or not? And you'll know when you need it and you do it a few times and maybe you get a little more experience and you won't need it anymore. So, you know, I apologize for slightly dodging your question there because it requires a legal opinion, but you'll know when you don't think your client has the capabilities to preserve their own data and you'll need to reach out to someone else. However, budget makes say you can't do that. Right. Part of my frustration in trying to get some of that digital information at the beginning is like how much have they been messing with it before we even got there so that's usually factored into that decision as well for me because they just want to start digging and figure out what happened but they don't realize that they're like potentially compromising information so it really depends on what the, what data they're digging into you know i look at when we're helping uh fraud investigators oh they have regular quickbooks oh crap you know, there's no audit log. There's no way to tell what happened. Oh, they have QuickBooks Enterprise. Oh, everything they do in that is tracked. Right. Or, oh, they have QuickBooks Crappy Edition. Excuse me, that's not a technical term. You know, they have the, you know, what I would call the free edition, meaning they're still running QuickBooks 2009. Mm -hmm. You know, we've seen that around. And yeah, they mess with it, but they have a backup system that has last month, the month before. And so, if you cheap on preservation early in collection, you may be saving money at the front end, but later on when you have to then go look at 20 different QuickBooks files, and I'm just using that as a simple example, you probably just cost yourself money because now the examiner is having to merge together multiple ledgers instead of just being able to look at the one that is the source of truth. So often our clients by them meddling to try to save them money, in the end cost themselves money and they, you generally learn that lesson once and then you're more careful the next time. And I'm just using QuickBooks as an example as it's easy. When you get onto the online systems, they're even better, they track everything. You know, we love QuickBooks Online. We like Office 365 because every version of the Excel document you made is saved and we can go get any version of it going back really, really far. We love things like Dropbox because all they're doing is creating evidence and creating snapshots of what the data looked like at a given time. The problem again is there's more data to look at because you have more copies of what that might be. So in yeah. the old days, we were super worried about it. Now we can generally tell the difference, but it's made the vectors of what we have to look at much larger. Yeah, that makes sense. So in working with fraud investigations, where have you found in your experience that digital forensics and e-discovery create the most value? It really comes to dealing with the communication in a coordinated fraud attempt. So if you look at 
internal fraud or embezzlement, I guess it's, as it's called in your case, you have either one party doing something, there's generally not going to be any other coordination going on. You're not going to see communications like text messages or voicemails or you know what have you. But if you think back to the classic movie fraud, and I always go back to Office Space. You know, if you haven't seen that movie, it's a great one to watch now if you're stuck at home. But <laughs> Office Space, they come up with this very complicated method to where they're going to take the pennies in a rounding fraction um, out of bank transactions and put it into a checking account. And so there's four or five of them that coordinate injecting this code into the banking system. And not to spoil the movie, it doesn't go very well. They end up doing it wrong for various reasons and get caught, kind of. So in that case, there's communication, there's code, there's text messages, you're actually loading material. In. And so those are things that may be outside of scope of a fraud, a traditional fraud investigator. However, you're the, the fraud investigator is the person who points out, hey, there's some other vector here that we need to go look at that I don't recognize. Can you go figure it out? And it's not the case that in digital forensics, we would have known that even existed. Right. You're the person saying, I have this hunch that they did it this way. And the first thing we would say, oh, no, that's not real. There's no point in spending your money on that. And then you tell us, no, no, I seriously want you to go look at it. And we go, oh, yeah, they were right. I mean, the only reason we start looking at new sources of data is because someone asks us a question that we didn't know the answer to. And we go, either whether we're checking the sources online or actually going onto the computer and looking at it, we find these new ways that people are hiding communication or um, stealing material or exfiltrating information. And not to give the most common method that people are using right now, you know, it's not really good to tell people how to commit fraud, right, Leah? Hmm, well. But, you know, you have to tell you how people are committing it so that you can detect it. Yes. The most common method that people are using for communicating with multiple parties is setting up a Gmail account and creating draft messages that have attachments and they never actually send the email. Right. If you just keep modifying the same message, there's no record that gets created of that. So it's difficult to go back and track that. And that's what actually, it wasn't something invented recently. That's what the 2011 uh, hijackers used to communicate was mm -hmm. draft messages sitting in a particular platform, which we won't mention. So we don't really know where to look until you bring us ideas, but the most common approach is, Hey, we need to find what's going on. The other classic example we find is where there's two sets of books. They yeah. have, you know, the real books and the other books. Yeah. And the only way you really find that is you go, wait, you know, what is this other version of, you know, going back to QuickBooks, why do we have two versions of QuickBooks installed on this computer? And when you go to collect it, you might say, give me all the QuickBooks files. And there may be one hidden in a zip file or something else. So there's other indicators that say, like we, we call something called a link file or an LNK file. Every time you open a Word document or an Excel document or really anything on your computer, your computer remembers exactly what you did. If you wanna see what that looks like, open up Word and go to file and choose recent or open, and you'll see a list of everything that you've opened, like the last 10 or 20 things. And at the bottom, you can click more, and you can click more, and you can click more, and it'll show you everything you've ever done in Word. The computer is the same way, and it tracks everything you've done. And so if an investigator says, hey, I'm worried about these dates, can you go look at some computer activity? It may uncover another set of books or additional communication that's out there. And that's our most common example. And the other fraud I want to talk about later is this external fraud we're seeing where people are convincing people to send money elsewhere. But again, I know that's later on in a conversation, but internal fraud is a very different animal this external fraud that's being pushed on to people. Yeah, I am very interested in talking about that. And, and maybe this is a good time to do that because I'm curious if there's a certain type of investigation. So think outside of, you know, forensic accounting or anything like that, but a certain type of investigation or case that tends to use these services more frequently than others. Yeah. So on the forensic side, the most common exam we have is, um, you know, to be polite, it's called the number six. It's also called the they stole stuff. Normally S is an expletive. They stole stuff exam. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's not did they steal something? It's what did they steal? And did they do it purposefully? And so our most common exam is you used to work for me. Now you work for someone else. What did you take? And it's not exclusive to high level executives. It could be anybody in the world that we're seeing, anybody at any level. 
most commonly you're seeing salespeople or uh, people that have access to account information taking that. You're also seeing business development people that build business plans. You know, one of my most um, common cases here in Oklahoma is that you used to work for my oil company. Now you work for some other oil company. What records did you take to help that other oil company and did you promise them in advance? And we've done cases in federal court in Houston for Devon Energy where someone stole nine gigabytes or terabytes worth of well data and theoretically sold it to someone else. We've done a case, federal case in Oklahoma City where someone left um, their employer and took a business plan with them to sell ethanol gas to another employer. And literally the day before they quit to go to the other job, they opened a Dropbox, uploaded all of their email, all of the business plan documents to Dropbox. Then two days later, we're at the new company and then they download all that stuff. And all this material comes from third party discovery through Dropbox showing us this activity. And right. so it, it's a very clear picture of what this individual did. And I don't think what people realize is when he went in and deleted the logo of the former company and did a control find for the former company's name and the business plan and put the new company in and then hit save, that also got uploaded to Dropbox. Mm -hmm. So not only do we have theft of the material, now we have use in a business transaction, which are the two key elements to proving a lot of these issues. So that's our com most common forensics case. Our most common e-discovery case is I have a pile of stuff. I don't know what it is. I need to look through it. Whether that pile came from a production from an opposing party or a collection of your own data. And that's where, honestly, Leah, you and I are taken out of the picture. We don't know enough about what's going on to be able to review documents. And so we have, they hire lawyers or review teams who have coding manuals that go through and review documents. And they're looking for, you know, whatever information they're training themselves to look for. And those review teams are either lawyers, associates, you know, people over in other countries looking at data. It just depends on the volume of it. You know, if you think about the uh, largest case we've ever done in e-discovery, it was the BP oil spill. And we had 11.1 billion pages of material loaded into an electronic review tool. And if you think about that, every time you ran a search, you got 250 million documents back. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> and, you know, there's no economics that make that work. And that's where in late 2011, we started seeing these new analytic tools that we all take for granted right now. You know, we all shop on Amazon or eBay or Walmart, and we're looking for a red shirt, and it suggests here's the 50 other ones that people bought, and here's a blue one. Ooh, I like that blue one. You click on that blue one. This is here's the blue one. Here's the other ones that are like that. We're used to that analytics of being pushed in a direction. And in 2011, that was still relatively new. But we use that technology, that machine learning is what it's called, or technology statistic review against these larger sets of documents that we had. So that 250 million results you got, you could then say, okay, great. Here's some sentences I'm looking for or phrases. Go find me more like this. and curate curate that library of 250 million so that the stuff I care about is at the top. And that's the technology that we're seeing in discovery is really augmenting our human experience using AI to help the computer give us a better product. And unfortunately for you and unfortunately for our clients, we haven't really figured out how to do that with numbers very well yet. And we mm -hmm. can't say, here's a QuickBooks file, tell me if there's fraud. It's, I mean, does that happen yet, Leah? Uh, we're pretty close actually at Workman Forensics. Yeah, we've built some pretty sweet things where we can do that for people. But it's really easy there in the, in, the, in the communication <laughs> world because we can curate a library of your data. And so yeah. when you talk about the most common approaches, that's where clients are bringing that material. It's, it's, it's even small cases. I mean, we, we have cases where there's a thousand emails and there's no budget to any, have anybody review them, but it's cheaper to let the computer look at them and go, oh, okay, here are the ones that are relevant to your claim. Here are the ones that are not. And then instead of having your attorney to look at a thousand at 200, 300, 400 dollars an hour, your attorney can look at 20. Right. And so your, your savings there, whatever you spent, you know, even if you spent two or three hundred dollars having the computer look at it, you got that savings back immediately by just making the, uh, the, the attorneys more efficient. Originally, the attorneys were nervous about that because it was taking hours away from them. And they've now realized that they're being, they're being able to put a better product out that's more efficient and more cost effective. And the clients like that. Yeah, for sure. 
And like you said, the client's the one that knows the story anyway. I mean, because I've had a client use a tool for hosting their email so that they could search email. And then we jumped in there and did some searching as well. And it just makes the whole process so much better than, I mean, even on the most basic level of not having to scroll through emails and then save them as PDFs and then save them to file, you know, just that whole thing, the software they used was so much easier just in the most basic sense. So I'm very happy about that. So one common thing that in our embezzlement cases that we have is that more often than not, the suspect had a company phone and, oh my goodness, the client always wants to know what was on that phone or what was on their tablets. And so for my next few questions, I'd like to kind of talk about real world versus CSI capabilities in your field. So like first, what types of information are you actually able to obtain from mobile devices? So let me address your CSI comment first. Yeah. So for those people out there that, you know, think CSI is real or any of those classes of show, you know, from whatever it is, whatever it is, I always go back and lawyers are asking me, but they did that. I'm like, well, look, there's a show called Law and Order. Is that real? There's a show called Boss and Legal. Is that real? And the lawyers go, okay, I understand the drama. You know, there is some basis of science and some of the techniques they use on those shows. But in reality, what happens is they compress the, the temporal or the time frame so much that, oh my gosh, we have a cell phone from someone who's been abducted. Let's figure out where they are. They bang on the keyboard for 20 seconds and the map pops up on the screen and says, that's where they are. Right. Those things are all possible, but that generally takes three months mm -hmm. and two subpoenas. It's just not instant like that. So you can appreciate that people will come to us and say, hey, I saw this done this way. And you always kind of ask them, where did you see that? And like, well, in a case. I'm like, no, a case on a TV show or a case in real life. And you generally get it out. But there's no such thing as a stupid question because some of the things they model on the computer or on the TV, excuse me, on the TV shows on the computer, we have become real life. So right now we're dealing with COVID-19 and we've seen that, these, these news reports that the government can track all these people via their cell phones. Well, we've seen that on the movies forever, you know, all the way back to Lawnmower Man, which is an ancient nerdy movie <laughs> where, you know, we got all the phones to ring at the same time or whatever. And we actually do have the capability. We as Google and Apple, to be clear, and the providers, AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile have the ability to do this, but Google and Apple really have a way to do it immediately. And if you're concerned about that and you're a Google user, go to your Google Maps, log in and click on your timeline and you'll see that Google knows where you've been for the last three, four years and you didn't know that, even when you're not using Google Maps. Right. And so that's the type of tracking data that's out there. So some things we see on TV a long time ago do come to fruition because honestly, where do the developers get the idea to write some of this stuff but from fiction? Now, I don't have my... And I'm not George Jetson. I don't have an automatic robot that cleans everything. I have a different kind of robot right now, but some of that futurism is out there. Okay. But cell phone data is the new gold mine that people are seeing. And it's overlooked so much because people think it's going to get deleted or destroyed. And so my entry into the cell phone, and that's where your question was headed, I, I understand, mm -hmm. was you know, my, my, my favorite example, this is a real life case on at 4:45 on a friday i get a call from a good friend of mine who is the hr director at a very large company they let go of a top level sales a c-level salesperson and for whatever reason the people who escorted that person on the building didn't do the it checklist don't know why and so the gentleman walked out the salesperson walked out with their cell phone with the company data on it didn't return their company laptop and other things like that. And so she is calling me saying, what do we do? And like I always tell people, there's always a human element to this. I said, did you call them and ask them to come back? And she goes, oh my gosh, you were my first call. That's a great idea. Because we get caught up in a technology solution when there's a human solution. Yep. So she calls him and he says, oh, I'm already headed to the lake for the weekend. I'm pretty upset but I'll come in on Monday and I'll give you all the company stuff back. Yeah, I know I have it. Great. She's like, whew, that was easy. I'm like, cause she wanted to start doing remote wipes and all this technology that these corporations have with MDM or mobile use provisioning. And some of that stuff works. 
a lot of it doesn't work the way that the IT people tell you it does. So Monday morning, um, they're nervous. So we fly there Sunday. And then it's me and one of my techs sitting in the room waiting for the gentleman to come in because they're this nervous about this. And of course, the former employee comes in with a lawyer. Oh, why is a lawyer here? <clears throat> well, we predicted this. And so the, the lawyer starts talking and says, here's the company laptop. So my tech opens it up, gets it turned on, gets the employee to log into it. We're great. We're logged in. And then they, we start asking for the material. We start asking for it in a very particular order. Okay, the company laptop. And we also notice you have this Microsoft Surface. Can we have that? And the guy says, well, I didn't really use it that much. We said, great, go ahead and open it, turn on it. And indeed, it hadn't been used in over 90 days because it's um, after directory certificate expired. So we just kind of set it aside and didn't care. And then we said, well, do what other de big devices do you have, like tablets or laptops? So I have an iPad the company gave me. And I'm looking around the room going, who knew we had an iPad? Mm -hmm. Nobody told me we had an iPad. And sure enough, the iPad's got a corporate sticker on the back of it. And you know that fell through the cracks. And so we great open the iPad, log into it. He said, the company iPad, I don't care, you keep it. And we're like, great, okay. So we start clicking on the iPad and um, get him to log into his iTunes account or his iCloud account, things like that. And then we say, okay, any other big devices? No. Do you have any thumb drives? And he gets like a handful of, I mean, literally like 1,700 hard thumb drives sets on the table and says, these are various company things. There might be some personal data on here, but you can just keep it. I don't care. You know? And then he makes a mistake and he says, I've already got what I want off of those. We're like, oh, I heard that. Nobody else heard it in the room. But I heard that, right? Mm -hmm. You know, so we're like, okay, 17 thumb drives. We'll deal with those later. We take a while to do those in real time. And we're like, great. Okay, now what about when now we need your your mobile devices, your cell phone, and you have a small little like um like a, a note tablet kind of thing. We need those. He gives us the little note tablet and it doesn't even work. We don't really care. And then he says, and then the lawyer says, Well, this is why I'm here. Because this weekend my client was at the lake. And his cell phone fell in the bottom of the lake, and we don't have it. Hmm. Okay. And of course, my my clients like this is this is you know they're just freaking out. And, I'm, and then I get a tap on the shoulder from my tech, and she shows me this thing on the screen, and I go, "Wow, this is going to be like the movies." You know, I'm thinking in my mind, "This is going to be awesome," because I state, "What well, that's interesting, sir." And I tell my client, I give my client like the winky signal, "Leave me alone. Let me do my job." Yeah, you, I'm sure you've done that before, Leah, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And just go with me on this. I said, that's interesting that your cell phone's at the bottom of the lake because your phone finished an iCloud back of about 7.45 this morning, which would mean your phone has really good coverage at the bottom of the lake, can find an outlet to plug into, and is connected to Wi-Fi and is locked. Right. So, mm -hmm. you know, is there some more information you have and then the lawyer like grabs the dude and walks out of the room. I hear some cussing in the hallway. And then they come back in the room with the cell phone. We'll be right back to this interview. If you're a small business owner or you serve small businesses, then you're probably familiar with the Paychecks Protection Program by this point. Whether you've received funds yet or not, in a few short weeks, you will need to provide your bank with documentation to request loan forgiveness. As a way for Workman Forensics to serve small businesses during this time, the Data Sleuth team has created a free Excel worksheet. This worksheet helps you track the uses of your Triple P loan funds, the required minimum payroll cost percentage, and the recommended supporting documentation. To access this free worksheet, visit www.workmanforensics.com forward slash WF dash products forward slash PPP dash funds dash worksheet to download a copy. The link will also be provided in the show notes. Welcome back to the podcast. Oh my goodness. And so what people don't realize is that the data is tracking pretty much everything they do. It's what, it's what happens. I mean, your, your iPhone is constantly backing itself up to the iCloud. So even if I don't get your device, I might be able to go find a backup from a few days ago, maybe a few weeks ago, less likely a few months ago. But when you deal with mobile devices, people used to think that the data is gone after I get another text message. And that's just not true anymore. Mm -hmm. And they also believe that only, the only way place that data exists is on the phone. 
In the iPhone world, that is absolutely not true. It's very difficult. Actually, it's pretty easy now, but if people don't do it. It's difficult to go and turn off your text message backing up. You have to go find it and then turn it off, and it's kind of difficult to do. It, it, it's hard enough that every time an iOS update comes, that feature may move. But in addition, on the iPhone world, people are turning on something called message streaming or, or messages in the cloud. And that lets your text messages appear on your MacBook or your iPad and your phone. And that means that all your text messages are, not, are now stored not only on your phone, but also in the cloud so they can be shared among the other devices. Right. And so text message is the most common thing people are looking at. And that's the thing that got us into this business. But there's other debate data that's on the device that is becoming more helpful, such as your phone knows where you've been basically its entire life through you know, the, the various location data. Every time you take a picture of your phone, there's a GPS coordinate stored in that picture. And so we can almost tell where your phone was by looking at the device without having to go to the third parties like Google or Apple or getting something called a mobility users report with cell site location and asthma. That's a mouthful. We won't cover that today. But there's a lot of other people that know where that device is. But communication is the number one thing that happens on these devices. And if you subpoena the cell phone companies, give me all the text messages from this party to this party, they're going to say, we don't have that. And they're telling the truth. Hmm. The text messages aren't stored by the phone company. They're just delivered to the devices. So the, the mobile devices are the, are the future that we're seeing. There are many computers. They store an amazing amount of data. And every time some update comes, we get new material. You know, when, we, when we have trouble extracting data from a mobile device, it's generally because it's an encrypted service, like an ephemeral messaging service, like uh, Snapchat or um, you know, Sandus or one of those tools that um, you know, even WhatsApp is encrypted now to where I can't necessarily get those text messages without some key that was prearranged. So that's the challenge we have out there is the technology is new in civil litigation. We generally don't learn about that until six, eight months after the accident. You know, Leah, even in your issue, when you get involved, how long, how, how, how long ago was the incident typically? Sometimes too long. <laughs> Sometimes yeah. like a couple months. Yeah, we're not law enforcement. We don't get to go arrest the person right now. It has to be figured out. And so people were messing with it. They were continuing to use their device. Maybe they went and upgraded and got a new one. You know, all these different problems that used to exist have become a little less of a problem because of the ubiquitous nature of backup and online backup. So in, in the area, we provide a lot of services related to helping you collect your mobile device, helping you get it filtered down to where it's a manageable review, and then actually presenting that evidence to the court. Because screenshots off of phones are not the best evidence. It may be the only evidence, but it's, there are apps out there that let you fake text messages. There are apps out there that let you fake sending text messages. And so just a screenshot of someone's phone saying, I received this text message that said X or Y may not be authentic without some other third party authentication or some other method. So we're dealing kind of with that whole fraud area in there of what's the true and actual correct evidence related to that mobile device. Right. Yeah. Kind of to make it parallel to what we do, you know, we can go get a bank statement that's on site from a client's office, or we can ask the bank for that same bank statement. And our policy is we try to go to the bank first because anyone could have messed with whatever that is sitting at the office. So just kind of the parallel there of getting to what's the best evidence in these situations. Yeah, to parlay off of that, I had a case in um, Philadelphia where a gentleman convinced our client, a Texas bank, to loan him 11 or $100 million. And he collateralized that loan with his investment account with another Texas bank. Mm -hmm. And what he did was he took his bank saying, which was a PDF. And guess what he did, Leah? Yeah, probably just. He modified it. it you know, instead, yeah. of, instead of being, you know, a half a millionaire, he's a 20 millionaire. And so it was obvious what he did back then because it was harder to do. Now, Adobe Acrobat and even Foxit to a degree, you can open up a scanned document and modify it and it will figure out the font and adjust it and there's no way to tell that it's not authentic. Right. 
there is some metadata that helps us, but it's really easy for a fraudster to make paper. I mean, it's so much more trivial now than the old days. So going back to what is the best evidence, you have to trace it back to the source and find the person who created it. Exactly. 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 So another area that seems to either be valuable or a black hole in our world of investigating is social media. So what types of services do you all provide in this area that assist with investigations? Collection and preservation is the most common in that area is because someone saw something on Facebook or Twitter and they need that entered as evidence. And if they went and got the screenshot themselves, people might think like we were just talking that it's not authentic. But if you have a, a neutral party or someone at arm's length is the word they use often in the business or a third party go gather it, it's, yeah, why do why, I don't have a dog in your fight? Yeah, I got paid to go collect the evidence, but I don't really care about your business or your lawsuit. I'm not, I'm not going to get anything from lying and I want to stay in business. <laughs> so collection and preservation is the most common. We are still assisting a lot of law firms and their clients in subpoena because there's still a confusion as to what can I subpoena from a social media provider and how do I do that and how do I ask for it? And the, for instance, I'll give you is if you send a subpoena to Facebook for information about a user, they're going to say, no, we don't do that. The users self-collect. And those of you that use Facebook regularly, if you go to your settings, you can actually cause Facebook to back up all of your Facebook and send you an email with a zip file to download. Hmm. Well, that's neat. But when you're, an when you're answering the questions as to what you want, you can choose whether you want deleted things, hidden things, private posts. There's a lot of choice as to what you make in that zip file. And then once you get that zip file, how useful is it depends on when you got it. Um, Facebook more recently after the whole uh, hacking thing during the election has changed a lot of what they do and what a lot of their APIs are accessible. The way we used to collect Facebook is now very different than the way we collect it today because they turned off our quote backdoor access to people's Facebook pages. Um, we, we never had a backdoor, but we had a faster access to that through this other interface. Now we have to do everything using their application to take the backup. And it's good, but it allows someone to go in and theoretically delete or alter a post, repost that, basically wash it, such that when you get the backup, you don't know that it's not authentic anymore. So there are still some authentication issues that occur with that. Versus Twitter, I can go back and look at tweets forever, including things that people deleted and altered. And then there's this new social media out there. It's not new to nerds necessarily, but it's new to the world. The things like Slack and Microsoft Teams, they're considered messaging applications, but they've actually kind of fallen into the social media as well because you can actually post rich media like pictures and other things. You get, so you can have harassment, you can have other things happening over those channels and they're cloud or web-based. So we have to be, careful as to what the platform is that they're using and how do we actually collect or can we collect and preserve that data and then eventually present it out. But most of what we're doing is going and getting this stuff, altering it in a way that the client can easily review it. And sometimes it's giving them an Excel. Sometimes it's taking it and putting it into a review platform like iConnect Xera. So they can actually do like you were talking about earlier, a web-based review application. And it's nice when you're reviewing disparate data. Give me all the cell phone messages, give me all the email, and give me all the Facebook posts, put them all into one database so I can look at them online and look at a timeline. That's extremely useful when trying to figure out what someone did or what happened to someone. And that's only something that you can do by aggregating that together. But it, on the social media side, it really depends on what the source of the data is and can you have access. Because people can close accounts, they get abandoned, and they eventually get deleted. And if you send a subpoena to Facebook for a deleted account, they're again going to say, we probably can't help you. You might be able to send them a subpoena with a, a couple gold bars and be able to help you more. But in general, the joke we use is when you send a subpoena to one of these providers, the lawyer receives your subpoena and flips a coin. And if it comes up heads, they say no. And Leah, what happens if it comes up tails? I don't know. They don't respond. Okay. So. Yeah. That's the typical scenario you get you know, is, is those providers. And then when you get to the little providers, these new social media startups that you've never heard of before, you're, you're, you're playing hit or miss. And we still aren't very successful 
at getting some of the legacy email providers even because people are still using this old email technology called POP and SMTP in such that the providers don't house or host that information. So social media is kind of that new world out there. We love for people to ask us questions about it. And unfortunately, the answer most of the time is no, that's not possible, but we'll try. Yeah. You know, we say that our line is, we challenge people twice. No, that's a bad idea. No, that's going to be a waste of money. And then they ask me a third time, okay, I'll shut up and do it. And so that's <laughs> kind of how, you know, we operate in our business. Yeah. So just to kind of clarify, whenever you're getting the information from these different providers and you're talking about putting it into a, a format that a client can search or an attorney can look at or whatever, is that from, like that is from the results of a subpoena? when you're able to actually do that? In some cases it is. In some cases it's a result from a collection that we were able to perpetuate on someone. Okay. So, you know, even though Facebook, and you got to get yourself out of the criminal world and into the civil world where we live most of the time, in the civil litigation world, everybody's cooperative and the court can order you to remember something. Um, for instance, in, versus in the criminal world, you can't be ordered to remember a password and you can't be punished really for not. <clears throat> I understand you can be ordered to put your thumb on your phone and they can force you to do that. But in the civil world, if you don't remember something or something gets deleted or purged that you should have had, you can actually be punished in your civil litigation for not remembering that. So in generally in civil world, everybody is cooperative and we don't have this problem of we're not going to have, tr we're going to have trouble finding the data. It's only when someone, it's only when you have these co-conspirator cases that are criminal in nature where we see that someone is not cooperating we can't get access to the data. I see. That makes sense. That's a good explanation. So the last topic I wanted to touch on is data authentication and photo authentication. And until I started talking with your team and putting this kind of outline and topics together for today, I had not even thought about these things. So I'm curious, what are these and in what types of cases have these been successful? So insurance fraud is the number one case where these come out. And the best example is a real case. I had a guy's house who flooded out in East Texas. And it flooded back in 2008. I get hired in 2010, maybe 2011. I can't remember the exact date. And I'm like, why do you need a computer forensics person to assist with a flood of a house? It doesn't make any sense. And the answer is because what happened was, at a deposition, the homeowner said, the part came out of my wall, I took it from the plumber, plumber, took it to my garage, marked the part with my initials, brought it back to the kitchen, and took photos of the part on my kitchen counter, and here's a printout of those photos. And the part that State Farm has, that their expert says I took a part, doesn't match the part that I took photos of the day of the flood. Great setup. Mm -hmm. You know, he's stating that, you know, the insurance company switched the parts. Now, to be blunt to most of your listeners, you probably know they don't do that. Right. That's a, that's a really bad thing for them to do. And if they did do, do it, it would probably have been done at the lowest level an adjuster or, you know, even the plumber might have done it. But in this case, what we ended up proving was it took us 11 months to actually get the electronic copy of this photo. Because guess what? Once we started asking questions about the picture, oh, I can't find it anymore. Oh, wait, wait, wait. The picture that proves that we owe you $3 million, you didn't bother to keep? Right. That doesn't smell right, does it, Leah? Oh, right, no. So eventually we get a court order that lets a third party go and get his computer out of his house and lo and behold, we find the original pictures of the part on his kitchen counter in their JPEG original form with all their metadata. And sure enough, when you look at the JPEG, it tells you it was taken the day that the flood was discovered. Great. You know, everybody's like, great, it's authentic. I'm like, no, 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 let's look at it closer. Because when you use a camera, there's actually an odometer in it, much like your car. It remembers every picture you take. And even if you reset the numbering, where it saves your files back as, you know, picture one or picture two, that original odometer is still in the metadata. And so what we were able to show was looking at the pictures he gave us from the, after the flood and the pictures around 
the dates of the flood and some pictures later on, several years later, we were able to show that what the gentleman did was he took his camera, changed the date and time, took the flood pictures, and then changed the date and time back. Because you're taking picture 7,100, you know, 7,010, and it's 2011, and then all of a sudden you're taking a picture that's 7,000, you know, the next picture, and it's 2008 again. Hmm. You take a few pictures, and then boom, it becomes 2011 again. So it's clear that this fraud was committed by simply changing the date on the camera. And what the what this person knew, they were very technical, the, the, the plaintiff here, was they kept, every time we taught them how we caught them, they would come up with another reason that they were right. Hmm. And so we showed them the numbers don't match. They said, oh, that's because I have early access. Or, you know, came up with different excuses. Oh, the metadata got screwed up because of the flood. Just every time coming up with a reason until eventually we didn't get any more reasons. We took it to the jury and the jury found in our favor. So much like in your business, the fraud always has a trail. Mm -hmm. You're going to find it. You just got to find the beginning of the trail. In our business, the only reason we think something suspicious is because you brought it to me and said, I don't trust this because of some external facts that I don't think I need to tell you. But can you look at this picture or this document and try to authenticate it for me? Yeah. Uh, other examples are if you look at a picture, and I, I just got this case last, you know, last year, it was a car accident and all the pictures from this lady's phone were square, meaning the same height and the same width. When was the last time you took a picture on your phone that was square? Like never. <laughs> never. I don't think about it. You know, and, and I'm like, lawyer, why do you think this is suspicious? Well, it just looks funny. I'm like, what specifically? I don't know. It just looks funny. And I'm like, well, right off the bat, it's square. No camera does that. It's been altered. And sure enough, what happened was the uh, driver had cropped out this sign that says, don't turn left. Oh. And again, here we go. Yeah. Six, seven months of discovery until we finally get a court to order us to get our phone. It's a different phone, but we have the, I mean, just all the things we talked about. And eventually we find the original picture. Sure enough, there's a sign. Don't turn left. And yeah. so the judge slaps her and says, look, you lose the lawsuit. And secondly, you owe them a bunch of money for this hysteria you put them through. So you owe their fees and the expert fees. Wow. So we as, you know, fraud, you and I would probably be really good fraudsters until someone that we taught how to do our business would catch us. Right. right? Does that right. make sense? Right. You know, there's yeah. someone smarter than us that hopefully we trained and is on the good side. And you know, we get away with it for a while, but eventually we'll get caught. Because okay. of that string, you start pulling it and you eventually find it. And so authentication of any digital evidence, especially pictures, is one of the things that bring, people bring to us. Other examples, Hurricane Harvey happened down in Houston, and we're still dealing with Hurricane Harvey cases right now. And I got a picture that I got sent by an insurance adjuster. Here's a picture of a guy's boat that's in his house, I mean, his garage. And then here's a picture during Harvey of his garage basically collapsing under the pressure of the water. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, great. The picture of the boat was taken with an iPhone 10, which came out a year after Harvey. Are we done? Oh, goodness. Yeah. And of course, the user says, well, that's because I switched to an iPhone 10. And when I moved the pictures from my old phone to my new phone, it changed. I'm like, no, it doesn't work that way. But the problem is, is that the plaintiff or the, the, the insured in that case convinces their attorney that that's what happened. And their attorney adamantly advocates for them until I come along and write an affidavit or a declaration as an extra witness saying, you're both wrong. Right. And then in the, and in the civil court, much like you're used to, the opposing party has to go find an expert to say that I'm wrong, or the court's required to believe me. Mm -hmm. And the nice thing about computer forensics, need discovery, and digital forensics, it's very rare you'll find someone else who disagrees with the facts, because that's what we report on. Right. Right. There's estimates and calculations you can do in forensic accounting, like do damages and stuff like that. And then there's also like more of the fact finding or what we call data sleuthing. And that's where I like to camp out. I mean, we'll do it all, but I like the facts because if we can, I mean, especially if we can be rational about it, we can just settle it because these are just facts. But yeah, but then you also end up with the people like you're describing that they just keep fighting it and fighting it. <laughs> so anyway, wow, that's super fascinating. And I can see that being extremely valuable in investigations these days because pictures, I mean, are just 
they're just so easy to take. And then thinking of disasters and, you know, we're not spending a lot of time on this podcast on COVID-19, but like any time there's a disaster and there's going to be insurance money or federal money or whatever, it's like a ripe situation for fraud. We, we believe that once we come out of COVID, we're going to see an influx of these, you used to work for me, you went home and worked for me, and now you work for someone else. Give me my stuff back. And there's just a mechanic there. You know, what happens if I'm working at home and get hired by a competitor? Right. You know, I can't, I'm not allowed to bring my stuff back. Do I ship it? Do you touch it? You know, in our lab, you know, we, we, are, we run a data center. So we have our own data center that we operate. Under the CDC guidance, we are still allowed to go into our office. Now, we don't have any customers coming by. We have one, maybe two people working. And they do two things. They receive shipments from customers that need to be plugged into the data center. They move hard drives around in the data center and they replace failed equipment in the data center. And so we're generally there from 9.30 until about three because we've got to cover all the FedEx shipment times and then we've got to deal with whatever is breaking in the data center. And so we're a minimal staff. You know, we've been operating remote for some time and well before anybody was required to operate remote. But for us, how is it that someone would go and collect that computer or that laptop or the iPad remotely? We just haven't solved those challenges of how do we terminate someone who took all their stuff home? So we're going to see an influx of those problems once they start coming to the service. We have a bunch of ideas. We can collect an iPhone remotely. We can collect a computer remotely. We can collect email remote. There's a lot of stuff we can do remotely. However, it requires the um, participation and cooperation of the party you're trying to collect. And so if you're adverse to someone, they're probably not going to cooperate. Right. And since the courts are closed, you're probably not going to go, and I'm not being blunt, but the courts are closed right now. You're probably not going to go get an emergency order to go collect some employee's material. The judge is going to say, I'm not going to the courtroom for that. Right. Maybe they will. I just, I can't, I can't guess what they're going to do. Um, so there's a lot of uncertainty right now, but we think we come out of this COVID there's going to be an increase of those exams. There's obviously going to be a lot of labor and employment litigation yes. based on what happens. And then you just have the regular business things that will come back. You know, there'll be, right. There will be more fraud. It's easier to commit fraud when I took the checks home to print instead of printing them in the office. Let me just go well, back to the basics. And in, in our experience, any time there's any type of, uh, you know, especially in Tulsa, oil and gas, like if the price of oil goes down, litigation related to embezzlement or partnership disputes increases for us because, you know, when there's a lot of money, nobody's really paying attention. But when all of a sudden that's tightened and you, you have to be on a budget, then it's like, wait, we should have more than this, you know? So I anticipate there's going to be quite a bit of those as well through all of this. So yeah, we talked about a lot of my favorite cases and I'm sure my favorite case hasn't come up yet. You know, it'll be one of these things oh. that happen. You know, I, yeah. I, I assumed after the BP oil spill, I'd never see another disaster like, or actually after Katrina, I'd never see another disaster. And then the oil spill happens. And then this happens. You know, last week, last year in Oklahoma, we were dealing with the floods. Yeah. So it's just, I don't remember this as a child. Maybe I just don't remember things well, but you know, is this the new normal? We don't know. And this, it's just going to create a more ripe opportunity for people to commit fraud, do things on their computer that are inappropriate, which is going to increase the, uh, the volume of these investigations. And unfortunately, we don't have a lot of these automated tools, mostly because by the time we write a tool that works for the iPhone that does an automatic investigation, Apple doesn't update and everything we wrote is wrong. Yeah. So we're yeah. constantly chasing ourselves there. Luckily for us, law enforcement is at the front end. They deal with it now. We get to deal with it a few months later. And then as expert witnesses, sometimes two years later. That's true. We have the benefit of time. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. What I like about talking to other experts is that, yes, even if these problems do increase, which we expect that they will, there are still experts like yourself, like your team, like us, that we know how to handle these situations. And because we do it all of the time, even when there's a change, we can just figure it out and we can help clients and law enforcement, attorneys, whoever. So that's why I love doing this podcast is just to be able to learn more from other experts and know that, oh, if there's an issue, there's somebody that I can, you know, refer and, 
and that we don't have to be helpless in these situations. Well, thank you for having me today. Yeah, thank you so much. I, I did want to ask if you would just let our listeners know if there's a good way to connect with you or with your team to find out more about your services. Uh, our best information source is our website, which is www.avancic, A-V-A-N-S-I-C.com. And there it talks about our services. You can um, send us messages. You can call us as well. Um, my project managers are the people who answer the phone. So you're not having to beat through a secretary or an answering service. The people who answer the phone can help you immediately. Uh, but all the resources are there. We do a lot of presentations. We do a lot of webinars lately. Um, and you know, we'd love to connect with anybody on what's going on. I also uh, pretty heavily follow LinkedIn. I unfortunately don't have a Facebook page. It's actually me. So, you know, don't, don't tell Facebook that yet, but you know, contact us through the website. Thank you very much for today. It was a good topic. It was a good conversation and uh, stay safe. Yeah. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. The investigation game podcast is a production of workman forensics. For more information about the topics we discuss on each episode, please visit workmanforensics.com. If you enjoy this podcast, please make sure to subscribe and leave us a review. You can also connect with us on any of the social media platforms by searching Workman Forensics. If you have any questions, comments, or topic ideas for the podcast, please email us at podcast at workmanforensics.com.